Thank you. Thank you, John. There couldn't possibly be a more appropriate intro video clip than that for your mental toughness training segment. For your mental toughness training session, this is mental toughness training. You are in a session right now. I'm, and I invite you to treat it like that because I am. I'm treating this like you are one massive client. Very, very massive client. And because, you know, the, the content that we're going to cover is identical to the content that I would cover in an initial uh, individual coaching session. So, you know, this is training. What it isn't is a motivational speech. And it's really important for me to make that distinction up front. If we're talking about getting in physical shape, like into like top peak physical condition, you know, um, then doing a motivational speech right now would be like, okay, will everybody please get your folding chairs and let's, we're going to go over to LA Fitness and we're going to sit outside the window and we'll have our big buckets of popcorn and a big sugary soda and we'll look in and we'll watch them do their workout and we'll, we'll get a nice concept of what it is like to, oh look, that person's doing abs. Oh, that's what, well, that's what, can, look at that, I'm getting motivated. This is, can you feel that? Look at the size of the place that guy's pumping. Ooh, this is good, this feels good. There's nothing, there's no growth that comes from that. This is work. So I invite you to actually, to, you know, to, to embrace these exercises. We're going to be covering disciplines. All right, you use the word discipline a lot. These are disciplines, these are practices, mental toughness, comes from working out, from working out your mind, from strengthening and conditioning the way that you use your brain. So let's get started. So it's been mentioned probably a thousand times over the last five days, TBSFOTP, the best sales force on the planet. What does it really mean? John, you asked that question on, on uh, Monday. Well, let's explore that a little bit. Because, we want, because we, what we don't want is for that to be a concept. What you don't want is for that to be a nice, cool, catchy, hip idea. You want this to be a reality. The best sales force on the planet is a massively bold statement. Good. Because, you know what, the best at anything, the bests at everything are remarkably bold and not apologetic for that. The world needs your boldness. Nelson Mandela said it in his inaugural speech in 1994 when he was elected president of South Africa. He was talking about, there's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. It's your light, not your darkness, that most frightens you. Let's get comfortable. This is what mental toughness is about. It's about getting really comfortable, stepping confidently into your own brilliance and not shying away from that. We are all designed for excellence. Let's get comfortable with that. So what does the best take? What's it going to take to actually be the best? It's going to take three things, and we're going to go over them. It takes clarity to decide, it takes courage to declare, and it takes discipline or mental toughness to DWIT, which stands for do what it takes. You have the clarity. You've already got clarity. What, what is it that you want? What is the mission here? The best sales force on the planet. You've established that. So you have clarity, which by the way, puts you ahead of the vast majority of people or sales forces in the world. Most people go through their entire lives never establishing clarity on what is exactly, what profound thing it is that you want to create. You've already got that. But the next step then is to treat that goal like a decision. To honor it in the way that it deserves to be honored. And having it be a goal isn't good enough. And we'll talk about that. We're going to spend time you know, establishing the, uh, the distinction between a decision and a goal. You also need the courage to declare. 
not just internally, but, but to the world. I mean, it takes enormous amounts of courage to say out loud to somebody what your real truth is. Because, you know, the reason it takes courage is because we've been conditioned to believe that it's really inappropriate. It's socially inappropriate to say stuff that sounds, that sounds arrogant or conceited. I work with a lot of, I work with pro athletes, but I also work with many, many more amateur athletes, many of whom aspire to be professional athletes. And a big part of our work is getting cool with, one, that you're committed to, to going professional, but two, is not being reluctant to articulate that in a natural, normal setting, when it, when it spontaneously you know, arises in a conversation, for example, uh, say, like, I, I work with a lot of college golfers, and say one of them is at home on the holidays and the parents have a holiday party, and one of the family friends says, you know, knows that the kid's been a super stud in junior golf forever, and is near graduation, and might say, so what are you doing after school? What are you going to do after you graduate? And, and, the, and the, the adult will phrase it that way. They know full well that the kid really wants to go pro, but they're actually like kind of rescuing him because of this social conditioning. They're like downgrading their decision. Instead of saying, so you're going to go pro, they might even just say, like, so what do you want to do after college? And then most people, because of social influence, would answer that question by saying something like, well, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to play some you know, local events and um, some golf events, and I'll play on the you know, mini tours and try to see if I can get onto the nation, which is all bullshit. Because what the kid really wants, what he really, really wants, if you get clean, and if I sit down with him uh, after that party and say, so what, what really is your truth? What, if you were being totally honest, what would you have said? He'd say, I'm going to play on the PGA Tour. But that's bold. And we've learned you know, not to be, that that's awkward, that's arrogant. We have learned to prioritize what other people think about us over our truths. That is not powerful, that is not mental toughness, that is not what the best sales force on the planet does. So enough talking about it, let's do a little demonstration. Can I invite Dave Earhart up, who's going to have a little love for Dave. I have I have never done a demonstration with alcohol in it, Bob. This is gr I love this company. Hey, man. Yeah? Good to see you. Uh, everyone knows that Dave is a you know, superstar in the company, uh, but I don't think that, maybe you didn't know, what you perhaps didn't know about him, is that he's a thespian. Now, anybody who was just half paying attention to what I just said is going to have a lot, they just, what? He's a what? He's a what? <laughs> You're going to get a lot of questions on that. Do we get to actually drink this? Uh, that's why I asked. Perfect. For it. <laughs> so we're <laughs> nothing Cheers. like a, a beer buzz in the morning. Cheryl Crow says. Amen. That's the first. <laughs> okay, so in this little role play, I'm going to be you. All right, I'm the CA salesperson, and we're at a sports bar. Just I don't know this guy. He's a stranger, and we're just watching some hockey action. Woo! Yes! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little, little into the Flyers game. It's a good game. We're, yeah, well, you know, I'm trying to sweep the pens. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing, man? Doing all right. I'm David. Hey, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here, actually, because um, there's no one else here. I feel a little weird being the only person you know, <laughs> drinking in the morning, but so, <laughs> you're my kind of guy. Yep, how absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, what do you do that gets you drinking in the morning. No, no. <laughs> I work for CA. <laughs> that was not on the script. <laughs> okay, take two. <laughs> you. What do you do? Uh, I'm a member of the best sales force on the planet. What about you? Well, I, I'm, I'm a dodger, but what would cool. you, right. you say you did? What do you? Oh, I'm a member of the best sales for, force on the planet. Okay. It's cool. It's uh, hmm. awesome. At, and what, are you on some list or some, what qualifies you to be on the best, Forbes or something said that or? You know what, I get, okay, so I get this a lot uh, and in all seriousness, um, you know, one of the most powerful, I'm a member of a massive sales team, okay, and 
and we made a decision. And the decision to be the best is, is not conditional upon being acknowledged by anybody for that. It was an inter it, uh, there was a moment in time, do you really want to hear about this? Yeah, I mean, I'd l love to know how you know I mean, you're the I, best salesman. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I know, it's a bold statement. I get that all the time, and I, I love talking about it. When people like you are interested, it's, it's a cool conversation. Most people are like, what a jackass. And they don't want to hear about that. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'll tell you about an event. It happened. It was April. It was our fiscal year 13 kickoff event. It was in Chicago. Right? It was April. It was a when, I, this is like vividly etched in my mind, and it will be forever, because it was like this remarkable moment where uh, it was Wednesday, April 18th, approximately 10, 11 a.m. Yeah. Not to get into too much detail, but uh, something amazing happened. I was in a room full of 1,500 of my sales comrades. We were all standing up. We'd all just made a personal internal commitment about being the best. So this, whole, this massive ballroom is all on its feet. And we made a collective decision. We like formalized this notion that we've been talking about. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever been in a room with 1,500 people where there's one thought. That's a big deal. Hmm. Like that's some intense energy. Like, like it was wild. Like one thought, 1,500 people, and the thought was, we are the best sales force on the planet. So, in that, so leading up to that moment, we, w we weren't the best sales force on the planet. We were talking about it. And life changed after that, and I'm not kidding, mm -hmm. that after we all stood and made that declaration, we wailed, we said it, we screamed it three times, and every single person, like all seven trillion cells of every person in that room was on board, was in sync with we are the best. So we made the decision, and after that, it's just all different. You know? So that, that's what qualifies us, is the fact that we decided it. Wow. Was so, that too long? I'm sorry. Yeah. Shit, we missed a goal. No, no, that's, that's actually, I'm, I'm intrigued. But so, so, I mean, how, how do you know? How do you know that you're the best? I mean, it's just, how do we know yeah, I mean, that? Did, yeah. Can you prove it to me? I mean, it's, it's, it's another great question. It's, no. Um, <laughs> Not yet. It's a decision. It's an internal state. Being the best at anything in the world is, is again, doesn't need to be qualified by anyone acknowledging that on the outside. I don't need to get on. I will. We tr trust me. We will be on those lists, whatever lists you are referring to. Mm. That will absolute. That can't not. Ha it can't not happen as a natural consequence of the fact that all 1,500 of us are in this state of absolute knowing and decidedness. Mm. So like that state then yields the actions that will create the results you're asking for. So hang tight. So it's, it's, that's heavy stuff. So is there like some number you're shooting for that, uh, that is going to prove Yeah, for like North America sells like a billion. It's, it's a billion. Billion? Yeah. Wow. So how are you going to get there? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I have no clue. <laughs> because we can't know that yet. There's no way to know that. But what, what we can know is that that will happen. What we do know is that that is guaranteed to happen by virtue of us having made the decision. So how, I can't tell you yet, but here's my card. And I invite you to uh, send me an email or give me a call in a year, right? Because then we'll have another beer. Right? And we'll sit down and I will happily show you exactly how we manifested that. Right on. It's cool, man. Right on. Nice to meet Thanks, you. Thanks, brother. All right. Can I take this with me? I think you should. Uh, Cheers. Cheers. Good work. <laughs> how about a little love? <laughs> little foreshadowing, by the way. Hint, hint. Things to come. We're going to really focus now, so we just covered the courage to declare. This is slightly exaggerated, but, but, but a lot of the content actually wasn't in that skit. Like that's the state that you're in when you're in absolute declaration. And, you know, and I really, I want to, I want to challenge you to actually see if you can create scenarios like that. So you can practice. So you can practice articulating it. Like own that. Own that you are the best sales force on the planet. And, and go out and like literally create scenarios with people where you get to practice declaring that.
You're not trying to sell them anything. You're just what you're doing is you're, you're actually convincing yourself. You're practicing being in that declaration. That's powerful for you to do. So what we're going to spend the rest of our time on now is the, the, the distinction between a decision and, and a goal, and then the discipline, which is the mental toughness right, to do what it takes to be the best sales force on the planet. All right, clarity to decide. Goals are very useful. Right? Goals are necessary. In order for us to get to where we want to be, we have to have goals. But like I said in the beginning, we can't let the goals remain goals. They can't just stay goals. We have to upgrade. Want, so we have a conversation, and we talk about what is it that we want to create. When that conversation is over, we're left with our goal. You know, there's been jillions of goals established this week right, and, and discussed, and I'm not trashing goals. What I'm saying is goals are awesome for the really good sales forces on the planet. The one of the good sales forces on the planet is happy to end their conversation with goals, but not the best. The best sales force on the planet arrives at the goal and then upgrades it and locks it into a decision. What's the difference? Well, the difference is a goal leaves open, leaves the door open for the possibility of not. Whereas a decision doesn't. That's bold. Goals are for people who lack the courage to make decisions. It's a bold statement. And good, because we're, you know what? We're being bold. It is very bold to say that you are the best sales force on the planet. It is very, very bold to make that decision. Goals as an end point are for people who either don't know how or who lack the courage to upgrade those goals into a decision. C can you get what it means to actually decide that you're going to do something without knowing how? Let's look at the hierarchy. If this is a ladder of certainty, and the lowest rung is, is hopelessness, where there's, like, there's no chance of you getting what you want, right? And then one up from that is doubting, where there's maybe a shred of chance that maybe you'll get, have, be, do what you want. And the wondering will say that's maybe a 50-50 chance. Hoping, better than 50 chance. But you know what? Hoping, when I'm hoping for something, it's like wishing. Like... Isn't it interesting that we have all these rituals in our culture that promote wishing? Because an act of wishing is saying that in order for my desire to become manifest, there's a, some force outside of me that needs to cooperate, so I'm depending on that, like uh, seeing a shooting star, making a wish, make a wish. Or is it, was it a dandelion that you blow all the things off of it? And you make a wish, or even like these sweet rituals, like they're actually beautiful, uh, like birthday candles. It's a wonderful, it's a loving, kind-hearted, nurturing ritual. So, yeah. But it promotes wishing. It, it, so imagine this. In fact, if anybody has um, a, you know, a birthday coming up or a child with a birthday coming up, try this. this <laughs> if you're looking for awkward. Uh, wait, okay, honey. It's, now it's time to blow out the candle. So, so make your birthday decision. And the kid will be like, what the heck, what you just, huh? Make your birthday decision. The distinction, of course, is so we go up to the top of the rung, the top rung on the ladder is knowing. Knowing, that's a decision. Knowing is the only powerful state. These are all states of mind, by the way, right? Hopelessness is a state, I'm doubting, I'm wondering, I'm hoping, or if I'm the best sales force on the planet, if I'm interested in really being excellent, if I'm interested in being the best that I'm designed to be, then I only have time for knowing, for an infinite commitment like that. That's all in. There's no turning back there. <laughs> this is an interesting place to be. You see what, what this guy's doing right now? He's doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on in that brain. 
like all these kinds of complex calculations, but everything that's going on in that brain is, is directed singularly towards one mission. It's getting it done, which in this case is probably not belly flopping. <laughs> right? It would be to enter the water safely, like vertically. So he's doing all these things. You know what he's not doing? He's not thinking, I want, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Can, I, can we turn around? <laughs> and you know what else he's not doing? What he's not doing is thinking about, he's not thinking to himself, don't belly flop. He, he doesn't have room. There's no time for that. When you are in the knowing, deciding state, there isn't any room for you to bring into your mind the possibility of, of not, or the awareness of what could go wrong. It's not, it's just not, there's, it can't be there. When you are in the absolute, and you all, every one of us has multiple examples, if we really think back to our lives, we have examples of, of times in our lives where we've made these all in totally knowing, infinitely committed decisions, and please remember them frequently, because that is a state that you want to imitate. You, hell, you want to live in that state. You want to become intimately familiar with that infinitely committed state of mind because that's you at your most powerful. So knowing is deciding. It is the decision-making state. I, all, I use the, the analogy of going out for a loaf of bread. Honey, um, I'll be right back. I'm just going to run out to the store. I noticed we're out of uh, bread. I'm going to go get another loaf. I'll be right back. So that's a decision. Now, imagine treating that like a goal. <laughs> Honey, uh, can you come in the living room, please? We need to talk. Yeah, sweetheart, relax. I've noticed that we're out of bread. It's OK. There's a lot more in the world. I know that. And I'm very confident that I can access it. So I'm going to go out there, and I am going to do my best to come back with a loaf of bread. That's awkward. I mean, she, she'd be like, oh, sweetheart, I thought you stopped doing drugs in college. <laughs> Who gives a damn about a loaf of bread? But, but, but it's like it's such a simple thing. Why would we downgrade you know, uh, the things that matter most to us? Why would I treat going for a loaf of bread powerfully with all this absolute commitment, but then the things that matter most to me, I would permit myself to downgrade it from a decision to a goal where I've now invited in the possibility of not again. Why would I do that? Like, why wouldn't I treat being the best salesperson on the planet with that same degree of absolute conviction that I you know, did with going to get a loaf of bread? Well, there's an answer. And the answer is, is because I can't see the how. See, I, with the bread, it's, like I, it's easy to see how am I going to pull that off. I'm going to get in the car, I'm going to drive to the store, and I'm gonna, it's like that's simple. How am I going to become the best salesperson on the planet? Well, I, I, I can't see the how in that. So that, this is what I call the how obstacle. It is the number one source of paralysis of people in pursuit of their desires. We've been conditioned over time to believe that I need to know exactly how this is going to work in order for me to take action. Now, I want to, I want to introduce to you one of my greatest mentors in life. The, 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 the guy who perhaps has, has modeled for me the power of, uh, of viewing the world in a doubtless way and who's inspired me to really, really upgrade my interpretations of the world. His name's Benny. And he's my nephew. So I have a story. I have a story about Benny. I'm, I'm at my sister's house back outside of Philly. That's her pad. <laughs> I hang out there often. And I'm, I'm kicking it. I'm watching an Eagles game on TV, football Sunday. And I throw, we'll pretend that this is a fireplace up here. I toss my keys. My, my car keys are up here. On the, on the mantle, and they're underneath 
one of these recessed lights, so they must be glistening. So my sister says, hey, Chris, Benny's coming in. Will you keep an eye on him? Yeah, I got him. What's up, dude? So he called. Now, he's like this big, so he crawls in the room. And uh, I'm watching the game. And this is back in the day when McNabb, Donovan McNabb was still our quarterback. So I'm going, jeez. You throw one more dirt ball, I swear to God, I'm going to kick your ass. So I'm watching the game. I get really, I get into Philly sports. So uh, Benny saw that sparkling object, and it must have become an object of desire for him. Because what happened next I, is nothing short of miraculous. He started crawling towards them. That's one of my best stories. Can I get a little love for that? <laughs> no. What, thank you. That's very generous of you. But I'm not done. What, what made that story so powerful is what didn't happen. You know what didn't happen? He didn't hesitate. He, he can't even stand up yet. The keys are like five feet off the ground. How the hell is he going to get the keys? He didn't have that kind... That's the power of this story, is he saw a thing. It became desirable to him, and the next thing that happened was instantaneous movement in the direction of. What he didn't do is go, oh, man, this look cool, whatever that is. I'd love to check it out, but how the hell am I going to get him? He didn't have the question. How am I going to do that? He simply moved in the direction of, and he's crawling across, and I'm watching the game, and I'm paying attention to him. He comes over here. He's starting to make some baby noises. I'm like, what, dude? What do you want? What? Oh, here. What do you want these? All right, there you go. <laughs> that kid teaches me so much. And, I, you know, it didn't really click in until later on. I'm like, what, what the hell just happened? That's a big deal. <laughs> well, I want to be that way. That way meaning I don't want to have any hesitation. Right? I, don't want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to interrupt the process of creating magnificence with uh, like wondering. With wondering how. He has yet to be, little Benny has yet to be educated about his limitations. Right? We don't. So that's what this mental toughness training is really. Is freeing ourselves. Unleashing. Unleashing is such a perfect metaphor for mental toughness training. You are literally unleashing your mind from the conditioning of your past. So this story about getting the keys and the whole thing about how, like the how obstruction, the how obstacle, we never need to worry about it. Like, like, like Dave said, asked me, he said, how are you going to reach that number? And I, I said, I, I got no idea. I, and I don't need to know. I know that by virtue of doing what Benny did, moving in the direction of the desire in that state of infinite committedness, of absolute knowing where I do not permit the possibility of not to enter my radar. I, can, I tell you, it's, it's happening. It is happening by virtue of having made the decision. And I'll just tell you later the details of how it unfolded. The how, get this, this is a great sentence. This is a keeper. Inherent within your decision is the, are the mechanics for its own fulfillment. The mechanics of how he's getting the keys is inside the decision. Like how, he couldn't have, Benny didn't have the capacity to predict that Uncle Chris would get up and hand him the keys. He couldn't have predicted that. The mechanics of how he manifested his desire in that case was already packed inherent within his decidedness, within his decision. Okay. All right, now let's move on to discipline. All right, so we've talked about decide. We've talked about Dave and I did the skit on, on uh, de declaration, right? And now let's talk about the mental toughness piece. All right, this is the discipline to do what it takes. Discipline is, is mental toughness. All right, now this I usually do this on a whiteboard. <laughs> this is the most kick-ass whiteboard I've ever seen in my life. I'm very excited about this. This formula, and, and I'm not exaggerating, 
This formula is, if you get this on a deep level, and then you integrate this freedom formula into your life, and you practice the discipline that's going to come with it, then I can very comfortably promise you that your life will be profoundly different in a really remarkably powerful way. I, I studied astrophysics for a little while, and we would come up with these formulas that actually would take like months to do. And at times, we'd like start up at that chalkboard up there and end like three months later with the, you know, the completed formula. And like, yeah, hoorah! And then like everybody's like, well, what are we doing with that? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Who cares? What was that? What a waste of time. This is so simple, and yet so instantaneously applicable to every discipline of your life. How your life unfolds, your life unfolds according to the way that you think. How you think governs how your life unfolds. The mind is the forerunner of all things. As man thinketh, so shall they become. There's all these different phrases. Life starts with your thinking. How I think governs how I feel my emotional states, my moods, state. State's a great word. We're going to use that word a lot. This is synonymous with state. How I think governs how I feel or my state. That alone is a massive realization. Most people don't live that way. Most people actually live in a victim mentality, which would be to have the yellow arrows go that way, where you know, like what goes on in the world results govern my states. If you can get just this part right here, that every mood I will ever experience is solely, is entirely the product of my own thoughts. Not what's going on in the world, not what that person just did to me, not what just happened, but of my thoughts, then you are free. Free to be powerful. Free to manipulate your states so that you can manipulate the outcomes in your life. So how I think governs my states or how I feel. How I feel, my states or moods then of course govern the action that I take or what I do, which of course then govern what happens in my life. And it all starts here. So if I'm thinking, Say coming into this, you, know, you could say you could make the argument that this, like being up here on a stage, is a form of performance. All right, so we'll just use this moment as an example. Say I'm coming into this and I'm thinking, this is awesome. What, what a killer company! I can't believe how fun this is. I'm so honored to be able to make a contribution. This stage is amazing. I love that I get to share the content of that I'm so passionate about. With so many people, I'm, I'm honored to be able to make a contribution. I'm, I'm actually, I feel like I'm really good at this, and uh, you know what, things couldn't be better. If I'm thinking thoughts like that, then how, of course, then how am I likely to feel? Well, I'm going to feel all great stuff. I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel pumped, right? I'm going to feel inspired. I'm going to feel competent. I'm going to feel expert, qualified. I'm going to feel enthused. All the good things, right? And when I feel like that, then how, of course, am I likely to do? And that's when I do my best. Now, if you need evidence of that, just think about, think about your own best performances of your life. No matter what, it, it doesn't matter, athletics, business, music, anything. Think about your best evers, your career performances, those isolated moments, those events where you were crushing it. And think about your state. And it's invariably true that it was an amazing state. Like your best evers. I've never met a human being who has said to me, uh, the day that I, I performed my best, I felt like crap. I was really pissed off. I never heard, you don't, that's not, it's just not how we're wired, which is a great thing. I mean, isn't that great that we've all evolved as a species in such a way that we're at our best when we feel our best? That's a pretty sweet deal. And it also gives us tremendous incentive in becoming emotional masters. If I, the better I feel, the better I do, the better my life is, then now I've got a lot of incentive to become excellent at elevating my state. And really, that's another way of like, summarizing what mental toughness training is about. It's about becoming an emotional warrior 
so that I, I only choose the highest states because I know when I'm operating in the highest states, which by the way just feels awesome and that's nice, you could stop there, but it doesn't stop there, that's when I crush. Now there's always a flip side. Say I'm coming into this event and I'm thinking, holy shit, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people out there. What if I forget what I was saying? What if I lose my train of thought? I don't know, I don't know, that nobody knows who I am. I'm a stranger to them. And I don't know if I'm good enough for this. Maybe they made a mistake in hiring me. What if I'm thinking crap like that? Then what kind of states am I creating? The states that we call low grade. Like I'm creating, I might be, well with those kinds of thoughts I'm probably creating panic. <laughs> I'm, I'm creating incompetency, I'm creating maybe regret, I'm creating fear, I'm creating anxiety. Low grade states that lead to failure of all forms of intelligence. <laughs> you get that? Low grade states lead to failure of intelligence. High grade states lead to activation of intelligence. And where do they come from? Where do all my states, every single state, I will ever experience comes from one place. Where is it? My thoughts. So if I'm thinking crap like that, then I feel bad. When I feel bad, I'm, I can't perform well, not sustainably. It is possible that you could have a pretty good performance. You might even have an excellent performance from time to time when you felt horrible, but that's not sustainable. And you certainly won't have a peak performance. It's that's not the way we're wired. It's not possible to have a peak performance, which, by the way, is all you're interested in because you're the best sales force on the planet. So why would we be interested in anything less than peak performance? Which means that we really want to invest a lot into this formula. We really want to get this so that we can really become amazing thinkers. If it's true, if it's true that the better I think, the better my life is, and the worse I think, the worse my life is, then we need to ask the question, where, where do my thoughts come from? Uh, oh, and, and all that originates with my thinking. So then where do my thoughts come from? The simplest answer is like Occam's razor. The simplest answer in this case is, is the answer, your brain. When I'm doing smaller groups where it's interactive and I, I, I actually literally solicit responses to that question, I, I'm very interested in hearing people's answers to that question. Where do your thoughts come from? And the most popular response is actually uh, experience or history or like what's going on. And that's the wrong answer. History, what's happened to me, right, what I'm used to or what's going on in the moment gives me options on how to think. But my thoughts come from my brain. I create them. And this is important. This is an important point to really embrace, that I'm responsible for every thought that, that ever travels through my mind. I'm, infinite, I'm totally and solely responsible for every thought, like the evil ones, the dark ones, I create them. The amazing ones, the powerful ones, the ones that serve me, I create them. The neutral ones, I create them, I create them all. Not necessarily on purpose, and that's what we're talking about here, is about conditioning your mind, strengthening the way that you use your mind, so that you will only choose to create thoughts that actually serve you. So if it's true that the better I think, the better my life is, the worse I think, the worse my life is, uh, and my thoughts come from my brain, then why so many, why so many undisciplined thoughts? It, you know, because we do it, like just pay attention to today. <laughs> Start watching your thoughts. You'd be amazed, humbled about how, how many times throughout the course of a day I actually generate a thought that has me feel unpleasant. It's, it's remarkably frequent. And that's true for every one of us, and that's not a problem because we get to upgrade that. That's the practice. But so why? So what's the, why so many undisciplined thoughts? And the answer is right here. It's because of elephants. It's not our fault. <laughs> it's elephants. I mean, that's obvious, right? So moving along. Now actually, so there's this interesting story about circus elephants, which I, I, I can't stand. I hate the concept of using animals in, in circuses, but, th but this is true. What happens is these animals, elephants have amazing memories. There's a phrase, I use history, but don't permit history to use me. Elephants 
have unbelievable memories, and they use those memories you know, for their massive migrations like across the you know, continent of Africa, but they also let their memories use them so in this context. So when, a, when an elephant in a circus is not being used, you know, they've got to put it somewhere, right? So they, they chain it up to a stake like that. And however long the chain is, is how far it can wander. That's its re region of freedom, right? And it reaches the limit. They're so, their memories are so good that it learns quickly. Like it can only go like maybe five paces and then the chain ends. So that's the limit there. Might make a mark. And then it knows very quickly it'll learn its diameter, the region it's, you know, in which it is free to explore, beyond which it cannot. And that might take like maybe a year, maybe less. The trainer knows that as soon as that elephant learns that boundary, he'll take the elephant out to the stake, leave it there, doesn't even need to put the chain on. The elephant won't wander. The elephant will not go outside its perceived boundary. It's not there. If you're standing there, you're like, go, go. But it won't because it's, it's learned that that's its limit. And it won't even go to explore beyond that. And that's, that's us. That is the power of conditioning. That is the power of the conditioning of our past. That's why we need mental toughness training so that we can unleash ourselves from the limiting lessons, the limiting, the conditioning of our past. Right? And then, of course, the next question is uh, how to do that. And I got to tell you, I, I haven't the faintest clue. So good luck with that. I'm out of here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Kidding, kidding, kidding. That would be very bad form, wouldn't it? Rude. Who hired that knob? Okay, so that's been, that's been theory. All right, so we've been talking about the theory. Now we're talking about the practice. Now here's the thing to do. Okay, so this is the deal. This is what you want to integrate. This is a discipline. And it's called catch, own, and replace. This is the freedom practice. Freeing yourself from the conditioning of your past so that you can experience yourself as the miraculous entity that you are and be the best sales force on the planet. So what is it that you're catching? You're catching, remember from the, the think from the freedom equation or formula, you're catching yourself whenever you're feeling anything even mildly unpleasant. Okay, so mental training is uniquely different from physical training because it's internal, right? It's about awareness. This is, it's called the, uh, the practice or process of self-inquiry. You're inquiring within yourself and saying, how am I doing in there? Like, how, am I, how well am I using my brain right now? So you want to check yourself. You, always, you want to be, get into the practice of throughout the day. Check, how am I feeling? How am I feeling right now? And catch yourself when you're feeling unpleasant. Okay, then the next step is to own it. And we'll use Marcus Aurelius one of the greatest Roman emperors who, you know, who was so loved by his people because one of the things that he got was this. <laughs> like he got all this. He taught his people this. He taught his armies. He taught ownership. He taught mental toughness. So let's read this. If you're distressed by anything external, the pain itself is not due, to, not due to the thing itself, but rather to your own estimate or interpretation of it, meaning the way you're thinking about it, and that you have the power to revoke at any moment. That's ownership. So what we're doing is we're taking ownership of the fact, so here we are, we'll go back to the beginning. I'm catching myself feeling unpleasant, right? So I'm like, oh man, I feel really, I feel really nervous. Okay, you know what, this just happened, okay? So I was back there before I came out, we'll just use the, the, the real deal here as an example. The freshest one I got is I'm backstage listening to John and I know I'm going on any second, and I started to feel nervous. I started to feel nervous. All right, so what I do, I caught that. I'm like, all right, you're nervous. That's not serving you. Nervous doesn't help you get the deal done. So then I owned it by saying, Ner my nervousness has nothing to do with the fact that there's a room full of 1,500 people on there, out there. It has nothing to do with that. My nervousness has to do with one thing alone, and it's my crappy thinking in this moment. So then the next step, of course, is to replace. I want to replace. I want to replace what? I want to replace my thought. 
I want to replace the thought that's creating the nervousness, right? Where is the nervousness coming from? One place, it's me thinking bad. Like maybe thinking like, I hope I, hope you, I, I, hope I do well. Right? So what was my replacement thought? My replacement thought, and this is true, is stop being so damn arrogant. Stop making this about you, you self-centered no, no, no. It's not about you. You're here to deliver something, a service. You're here. You've been given this beautiful honor of making a contribution. Okay, just go do that. And instantly, the nervousness subsided, and I became passionate. So that's the practice. And then you want to practice that. Like, if you've got a practice, if you could find 100 opportunities, and you can, because they're there, for the remainder of just today, to do that, you tomorrow will be significantly more mentally tough than you were today. So the best sales force on the planet takes absolute ownership of their states and practices upgrading them. How? How do you upgrade them? Upgrade your thoughts. How do I uh, replace? Just stop it. Stop creating the undisciplined thoughts and replace it. It's that simple. And it doesn't matter, like she said, yeah, but all of my life, who cares? <laughs> doesn't matter. Stop. Stop creating. Replace. Catch on and replace. Okay, so one final distinction. Interpretation versus observation. All right, this is to further clarify how do we upgrade our thoughts. This is the range. We'll say this is the range of uh, possible human emotions. All right, obviously the negative sign is the lowest. All right, that's pure suffering. And at the top, the plus sign, we'll say is pure bliss and the null set symbol, neutral, in the middle, okay? Right now in this moment, every one of you has access to every state on that entire scale. Right now in this moment, you have infinite access to bliss, you have, access, you have equal access to pure suffering, it, it, or neutral, everything in between, and whatever you're experiencing is only because of one thing, and it's how you're thinking in this moment. As long as I'm awake, I am in the practice of interpreting. I'm interpreting my reality in one of three ways. Either in a way that has me feel bad, that's the low grade, right down the bottom, below the observation line, in a neutral way, which is observation, or above the O, above the O line, which would be a high grade, disciplined way of interpreting reality. And I'm always doing that. And the way to know is how do I feel, right? So the difference between an interpretation and an observation is an interpretation has a story, an emotional attachment to it. An observation would be, like if we're talking about weather, you say, um, it's cold and wet and rainy and windy outside. That's an observation. An interpretation would be the weather sucks. That's, an, that's a story about it, right? You could say, um, there was a Bob Newhart video on just now. That's an observation. An interpretation would be, it was awesome. So there are interpretations that serve us, and there are interpretations that debilitate us. What we want to do is choose the interpretations. In other words, to choose to view the world in a way that only serves us. That's a choice. Make it, right? Let's get above the O line. I want observation to be my lowest form of interpretation. Eliminating complaints is a brilliant idea. Complaining by nature, by definition, is below the O-line. That's me having a problem with what is. It's stupid, and it's not what the best sales force on the planet does. Eliminate complaints. Ne the worst you want to do is to, is to neutralize a complaint. Here's a mantra for you to do that. Ain't bad, just is. Ain't bad, just is, is a brilliant replacement thought for any complaint you ever have. So get above the O-line, trust me, you do not want to be below the O-line. Take a look, see why. When you go below the O-line, you get angry. When you get angry, you blow off steam. When you blow off steam, accidents happen. When accidents happen, you get an eye patch. When you get an eye patch, people think you're tough. When people think you're tough, people want to see how tough you are. And when people want to see how tough you are, you wake up in a roadside ditch. Don't wake up in a roadside ditch.
get rid of low-grade interpretation and upgrade to disciplined thinking. Call 1-800-ABOVE-THE-O. You don't want to go below the O-line. All right, so here are the disciplines or practices we've talked about, all right? Catch, own, and replace. You want to elevate your state. Catch yourself feeling unpleasant. Take ownership of it by saying, I'm not feeling this way because of what's going on. I'm feeling this way only because of the way that I'm choosing to interpret it, which obviously is below the O-line. All right, elevate your state. Eliminate complaints. Upgrade your interpretations to, at worst, ain't bad, just is. And honor your goals with, with, with such commitment to upgrade them to decisions. By any chance, is the best salesperson on the planet in the house? Yes. Please stand if you are that person. <laughs> Please remain standing now. We are, we are about, this is the, a little foreshadowing that Dave and I gave in our skit is, is now, okay? This is, where, this is when it all changes. So we've been talking about the best sales force on the planet. And, you know, maybe you already are that. Well, let's confirm that, okay? Let's formalize it so that it's been collectively decided in a moment that you'll remember for the rest of your lives. It's done. And then everything changes forward. So let's not have this be like a nice loud chant. Let's have this be clear. What I want you to do, please, on an individual level, is get so committed that you are choosing to embrace this. This is a decision. You are right now, 1,500 people are going to share one thought. That is so powerful. You know, it, like you can, there's a thing called an EEG, an electroencephalograph. It measures you know, your thoughts. The, the ener it's called electro because you put out electricity. One thought among 1,500 people changes the world. It is that electric. Let's create that. I'm going to count to three. Get committed. Because from now on, I mean, you, 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 there may be stories about this moment for, for, for the remainder of this company's history. Get committed. From this moment forward, you are the best sales force on the planet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And you're going to say, we are the best sales force on the planet. And you're going to do it three times. Are you willing to do that? Yes. Are you ready to do that? Yes. One. Two, three. We are the best sales force on the planet. We are the best sales force on the planet. Come on. We are the best sales force on the planet. Congratulations. Thank you. It's awesome. It's only, it's only news until you make it bad news. So Chris taught me, and I loved it. Kids, when they're in the traffic, you're complaining, they're not. They're just loving to be with mom and dad. You ever notice that? Think about it. Yeah, I know, it's a little Oprah-ish for, for such meat-eating junkyard dogs, but it's true. It's the way the world works. And I'm, and I'm going to give you permission to challenge me on it being above the line, and to challenge each other when, you're, when you see people falling below. And you are going to fall below. The key is to catch back and get back above it. So don't be too critical of one another.